Adam, welcome back, brother. Thanks for thanks for having me back. Repeat yeah, episode. That's right. That's right. And uh, just like we were talking about just before this started recording, it's so refreshing to be able to speak about philosophy and metaphysics with someone who's well read and like really knows how to expand on these abstract ideas. So, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of fun. I wish honestly that um, in the past couple of days since we had started about you know, possibly doing this again. I wish I'd gone back and re-listened to our last episode because oh, yeah. I remember obviously just having, you know, so much fun talking with you. Um, and that's why I was so glad that I, you know, swiped up on your story. I can't even really particularly remember um, what it was. But when I was like kind of going back and looking at the messages, and this just speaks to like the philosophical mind, like wanting to just ask questions. I remember the question I asked you, I wasn't like, it wasn't because I was upset at what you'd said or, no, wanted, right. you know, wanted to prove you wrong or anything. Like, I was just curious. Cause like, I honestly probably agreed with it, but it's so fun to ask questions. Yeah. And I think that's where, like, if somebody wanted to get more, more into philosophy, more into just like having conversations like this, it's like all in just asking good questions to people. You just hit on something so, so true, man. And I think that's like a symptom of society in which if you cannot handle questions from other people, that means you're not asking yourself the questions in the first place, meaning there's like a very fragile uh, self-protecting mechanism going on, which I used to judge people very heavily for it. But I think right now I found my peace because um, when your main concerns are paying the bills and like more of the security base of the hierarchy of needs, of course, you're not really going to start wondering about metaphysics and stuff. So I started giving more leniency to people based on that. But a lot of our community, like people like who, who we know and in our social circles, like if they do have the chance to start thinking, if they have all their finances in order, for instance, I think it's one of the healthier things to do is to just be able to take in questions, like try to shatter your pre-held beliefs because a lot of our values are just inherited. Like a lot of people don't really question what they are taught, what they're, th what they think. Um, and yeah, I think I did not take your question personally at all. You, were so I'm going to give some backstory on the, um, on the story you're talking about. Yeah, so I posted a story. <laughs> yeah. So I posted a story. I was like, all right, guys, let's, uh, Let's see. So if you ever took like a few moments to just observe the world, you notice that it takes a lot of effort to impose order like in the world. And if you look at the natural world, you'll notice it's just chaotic. It's spontaneous. It's random. Things just happen. And so therefore, one could draw the conclusion that there must be like a great architect or someone imposing order on things because uh, it, it, otherwise it would just be super spontaneous. And then the second point was that um, you could also observe that all of life comes from other life, like the animate things that are animate, they don't come from something that's inanimate. So there has to be something abilitating all this animation, all this, anim I, I, I said there must be an animator. animator. So <laughs> so I, I therefore like pulled those two ideas. And I was like, so therefore one could safely conclude if they want to, that there could be a great architect, a god. And then you commented your question. Do you remember your question? Yeah, I actually, I pulled it up um, right now. I s said, uh, you don't think that there is like a natural order to the world, ants, bees, other animals. And the point that I was obviously trying to get at is like when like humans watch nature, like mm -hmm. there are all these things going about in an organized fashion and like in a very similar way we humans do the same thing like that's kind of one of my favorite things when i look out at the world and i see people rightfully so saying like this bad thing's happening or this thing's happening or this thing's happening and it's like we we see that in animals too you know like we see right. that across the board but i I'd, I'd ask that and i'll even read your response to me which because i thought it was great like um and i think that's like the most important thing too is like when I'm asking a question, I'm not hoping to get a certain answer out of you. Like, I'm genuinely mm -hmm. curious as to more of, like, for you to expound more on what brought you to asking that question or whatever it may be. And you'd said, 
I'd say there's an order that comes from being animate beings, but even still, they are reactionary beings and not creative beings. A horse today will do what a horse did in 200 BC and what a horse will do in 3000 AD. So in the natural world, there's actions and reactions, chaos and instincts. But as soon as creative beings with divine providence, us, which is something I, I firmly believe, like we have this ability for creation that no other animal, no other being that we know of has, mm -hmm. um, comes in and imposes order. We are doing so with great effort. And I really resonated with that point too, like the effort that it takes yeah. to organize and to do all these things. Uh, and you said one could argue that resistance in creation is what makes uh, man different from beast. So it was just, it was chef's kisses to that. <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, there's a lot there that um, that I think there's a little nuances and stuff there. But of course, yeah, appreciate you reading that. I think there's a there's a key distinction to be made of like when one is observing bees or like animals, for instance. Yes, there's like some order there that they're doing. But if you look at the cause of that order, I think is comes from them being animate beings, meaning there's like little like residuals of the great architect that said, OK, we're going to have some order and when there is nothing. Suddenly there was light, suddenly there was something. And so there's a little leftover residue there. But even still, that type of action that those animals, the natural world is doing, it's just reactionary. It's just instinct. It's not, it's nothing actually creative. And that's why I said, like, the, the thing about the horse, if you ever look at an animal now, they're doing the exact same thing. They're just responding to stimuli. They're not creating cities. They're not creating new systems. They're not thinking about their thinking. There's no metacognition. So I think that is like one huge clue that, that there's a distinction there between man and beast. So, yeah, no. And I mean, again, great point. And I think one of the big things too, with what you said and like something I'd like to talk about more is that effort that you'd mentioned, mm -hmm. like, because I mean, if you want to take it to, you know, your day to day, what, what do you think causes like depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. all these things? It, it has to be like that effort that you're trying to expend to order your world or like to, to yeah. put everything into order. Um, and maybe even, you know, if we want to talk about Camus to give it meaning, like the effort that it takes to give your life some form of meaning, mm -hmm. um, it does take a toll and it takes a lot out of you. Um, and I wonder if that's even, again, something that's on people's minds. Cause again, you're talking about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you don't have that like base survival or financial freedom, you're not going to be able to be like, oh, what's the meaning of my life? You know, yeah, like that's exactly. not how you're going to be able to talk about things. Exactly. Um, and I know you're well read on Camus and you let me know that it was his birthday recently. <laughs> yeah. So that's exciting. I think that's appropriate. Like, can you take us down a rabbit hole of Camus and how his thoughts influenced you? I could. I'll, I'll tell you about like my first um, experience of like reading him. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, you know, a freshman or no, a sophomore in college working towards my philosophy minor. And I had to take an existentialism course. Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say I have to. I get to um, mm -hmm. because it quickly became my favorite course. It's a very unique structure for the class. It was once a week, three hours. And it was, I think, at like six o'clock. It was a late night class. And oh. the professor did that for a reason. He said that it was because you can't be expected to go from a calculus class to sitting in this class and believe that you're like going to be fully there to participate. Like it just it requires a different setting, more intimate, quieter mm -hmm. night. Um, and how it worked was. The professor didn't really lecture on anything. A group of four would receive like a different uh, existential piece of writing, and then you'd have to create a presentation to give to the rest of the class. Okay. So you basically just shepherded everybody, and then it was full conversation. So um, the first piece of writing was The Stranger. Um, yeah. And I was, you know, again, 21. Um, and had never experienced any writing like that or reading because it's not something that you are 
really exposed to in traditional education. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget. And like, if you haven't read it, it's absolutely, I think it's like the first book you should read of his. Um, but it just turned my entire life on its head by the fact that like, I mean, I work so hard to live a good life to try and live with like my morals, my purpose, let those things lead me try and like find the meaning and what I was supposed to do with my time. Um, and to not to give too much away, but to just see, um, in such a like beautiful literary way, uh, a world where that's not the case. Like mm -hmm. the person next to you, you know, could think completely differently and this world could be completely indifferent. And it was really big for me because it was the first time I realized that maybe I'm not the hero. Maybe this doesn't all work out for me. And mm -hmm. like, maybe God forbid I have a freak accident, blah, blah, blah. I don't get to fulfill these purposes and these morals that I want. Um, but there was also a little bit of a freedom in that because it just like gave me up to the, the possible nothingness or absurdism of the world. Um, and so it takes some grappling with, but it, it's, um, yeah. it's a great story and he's a great writer. Dude. Yeah, I know he's, he's a very powerful writer. That's, that's a big idea to digest at that age, man. Absurdism. Yeah. Um, it definitely led to, uh, an existential crisis of mine, like mm -hmm. wholeheartedly, especially just like having that whole class, um, you know, cause like you read about Kierkegaard and, I can't even remember Nietzsche, obviously, like so many different philosophers. Um, but it also kind of like steered me down. I started reading Charles Bukowski um, yeah. and like started to go that route. And he's somebody that I'm actually finding like a lot of inspiration in currently, um, but definitely like a trajectory change of my life just from, you know, learning about these concepts. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think there comes a point where in someone's like philosophical journey, um, they come across like the more crude side of things, um, Bukowski particularly. And it is like, for lack of a better term, like ugly philosophy, you know, like everyone like starts off with your Greeks or start with like the pretty things. Um, but then when you start getting into the ideas of like absurdity, um, existentialism you you're like toe to toe with nihilism and yeah. especially at that age where you're like if nothing matters well right also like anthropologically like you at that age are trying to like plug yourself into society like where do i fit in like where do i fit in in all these different dimensions and then to have the idea the seed like planted in there like maybe what i do right now doesn't matter it's it's pretty dangerous and you definitely see a lot of uh it i don't know if you've read some of these like school shooters manifestos if, like, no. if you, it's crazy like they're all like somewhat complaining about the same thing of course there's like the uh incel aspect of it but if you look at the philosophically the, their philosophical argument it's like nothing matters like nothing i do matters like it's it's a it's a surrender to this. So I, yeah. I'm just curious, like how you have found a way to flip the script. Cause I do believe like the message could be true and it probably is true that like nothing matters. But for me, because nothing matters, then everything matters because it's so finite. It's so important, so valuable, but that's a, t that's a philosophical psychological switch one has to do. Um, and I don't know, a, have you like done that fully and b like, how did you get to a place to, healthily to like have a healthy out outlook on life yeah uh i mean it's that's a great question um i mean one thing i'll always say is i remember even being in like my philosophy 101 classes and that was really my first time being exposed to anyone who was nihilistic like it's i i don't want to like stereotype people but it it's a very interesting um person because i feel like they're always wearing like goth clothes like in all of my classes that's like that's what they were generally wearing um but i just like i think that there's somewhere deep within me that just knows how dangerous that is like mm -hmm. doesn't i don't want to i don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole like mm -hmm. i don't want any of those feelings um 
mainly because I, I know it's not healthy for me. Like maybe so, but I know it's not healthy for me. I know it's not going to help me be happier. So it's almost like a conscious decision that I cannot, I, and I make it like, I can't go, I can't be nihilistic. Um, I need to, even if there is no inherent meaning, like I I have to be the master of my own ship. I have to like steer myself. I have to create my own purpose um, because it's kind of like if you believe in God or if you don't, like say you do believe in God, there is no God. Uh, you, you didn't really, you know, you didn't end up with anything bad for that. But like say you don't believe in God and there is a God, mm-hmm. you're going to be a lot worse off. So you might as right. well like spend the time maybe setting yourself up. Um, I guess that might be kind of my my thoughts on how I got to where I am now. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So like sometimes, and I think I said this to you too, like sometimes the utility of God is more important than trying to prove his existence. Yes. And if you, like in society and even just for yourself, for your own like mental sanity, the idea that there are spiritual and like cosmic consequences to what you do now that can save you just outright. That can just save your life, you know? Yeah, it can. And I think for me too, I always just had, you know, so many synchronicities in my life that Mm -hmm. for me, there was almost no way to ignore all of that. Like, and sure, you can definitely stretch things to make something a synchronicity or, you know, do whatever. But um, I think that was something we talked about in our last episode as well. Um, But yeah, I, all I can say is I strongly disagree with nihilism as um, at somebody having as their viewpoint. Cause I, I think I might've talked about this previously as well. I had to talk to my best friend about that. I had to be like, mm-hmm. Hey, like you are exhibiting, like you're thinking nihilistically and especially for your mental health, it is never ever going to benefit you. Like it is only going to take you to a worse place. Um, and so, yeah, for anyone listening, be really conscious and, and, aware of that yeah absolutely um it's funny you mentioned the synchronicities will coomer um yep. talking he, to him later today actually yeah yeah so let's go he, dude he's he's a, he's the guy he's the guy he's the guy he's so sure. he's so on it with the stuff he's so he actually recommended that i um get it create a synchronicity journal which is what i like created very cool. And just like write down all the little synchronicities that pop up. And I was like, okay, I'll get a few. Dude, I'm like almost halfway <laughs> done with the book. Like just all these crazy little things. And by doing so, I actually am building that awareness muscle. So I'm actually noticing more. Yeah. So maybe there was this many all along and I'm just now starting to notice them, you know, and it makes it more special because now I'm so in tune. My mind is so fine tuned to notice these little things that life just becomes fucking awesome. Like you just walk out and you're like, holy shit, there's that, there's this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how would you say that recording all these synchronicities has changed how you look at like the decisions you want to make in the future? So we were just talking about how you want to kind of like try and slow it down a little bit. Yeah. Is there any synchronicities or anything that have helped you come to these decisions or do you use them to make decisions now? yeah yeah uh particularly on the side of family and stuff like a lot of these things i'm noticing for instance this is crazy i was just in bolivia in south america and there's this like sweater that i saw like right in front of like a pew or two ahead of me in church there's a girl wearing a sweater and someone really important in my life had the exact same pattern exact same sweater like years ago and like i called back to that and so i noticed that there's a lot of synchronicities with like very minor moments that I would have forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so what that made me feel, how that makes me feel right now and ties me back to my past makes me like push it even more ahead. So I'm like, if that planted seeds, like that event eight years ago, planted seeds that like sprouted now, I should be planting seeds right now. Like everything I do matters. So the small feelings, the little moments, the tiny little things, those matter because they pop up like five years later, two years later, like, it made me appreciate the small moments a lot more because I used to just brush off a lot of like small conversations with people, like going to a grocery store, like just not looking up. Like I used to brush off a lot of that, but now I notice how deeply impactful those small moments can be, you know? Yeah. And it just sounds 
like a a way to live with more intention yeah and i've found that the more intention you live with life just becomes fun like mm -hmm. it is it is a very enjoyable thing like i mean i, I we talked about it earlier like i i was did door-to-door -door sales this summer so i mean not not a ton of fun uh it's not a fun endeavor uh but there was plenty of moments of fun like there's uh anytime you're striving for something like that have like a lofty goal and people chasing their goals with you like the experiences that you have there and the fun that you have there um like it just feels like it's so much more um but yeah man i mean that's awesome like living intentionally living mm. with that purpose and like it's cool because you could ask me or you how we feel about our lives and i'm sure we'd give pretty good answers because like i don't want to speak for you but i'm internally like i'm a very happy person like mm -hmm. my baseline is pretty high um like that is the proof in our philosophy and that like how you live your life i believe is like how anyone if somebody looked at your life they can be like oh that was their life philosophy like that's how they right. wanted to live you know um and i think there's something like really powerful in sharing that with people mm -hmm. and then just like trying to live that good life even if you're not posting about it even if you're not talking about it like if you're just living like a simple good life like i think we need more people trying to do that exactly exactly there's something about to an ideal knowing you're going to fall short but just that journey of an idea or an ideal or a credo that has outlived you and that will outlive you i think that is one of the most rewarding things um for instance like you're talking about like people not posting stuff um i'm in an airbnb just outside of madrid's like proper mm -hmm. and it's a little tiny small town called sevilla la nueva it's it's like 30 minutes south right there's fucking nobody here okay <laughs> but i chose this because i'm like doing somewhat of like a monk mode not, I'm, I'm an extrovert like i love talking to people so my uh, social calibration it gets done when I go to the grocery store, when I go buy things at the farmer's market here, when I go to the little parish here, like, and what I've noticed, like this, I like wrote like a full page just on the short time I've been here in the synchronicity journal. So many little things happening here, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but there's like little opportunities. For instance, I got here and like the next Saturday, I saw that there was like a paper on the parish. They're like, we are going on a road trip for the day to this town two hours up north. And I've always wanted to go to this town, this town in this Valladolid. It used to be the city of Spain like years ago. Like that's where Columbus died. Like it's a, like a well-known city. And I've always wanted to go. And I was like, holy shit, there's this opportunity to go. And it's like 20 euros. They'll feed you. They'll take you a bus. So I was like, fuck it. I'll sign up. I went to the 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 priest. He's like not much older than me. And I got to talking with them and everything. And it was me, that priest, and like 20 old ladies, like 20 like <laughs> grandmas, right? <laughs> and so we go two hours and a half up north. We go to the city and it, we go to this parish. And I'm like, all right, I know there's going to be some kind of lesson to come out of this. Like there's a reason why I, I read that paper. There's a reason why I came to this town. Something drew me here, right? So we go, we go to mass and everything. And then... We come across into this like smaller church that there was there and that church that was where this one friar like studied bernardo something and he, this is like 300 400 years ago and he, he was like studying and he like an idea came to him which is the idea of the sacred heart which is like if you ever seen like a statue of christ there's like his heart and it's like on fire it's like right in the center so that idea came to him and he like made it popular throughout all of Spain and throughout the whole like Europe and everything. But one of the tenants, there's like three main tenants of that idea, but one of them is that, yes, you should feel bad about sinning and you should have some sort of guilt. Yeah, which I like struggle with a lot with like my morality. I think we talked a little bit about morality, but he, there's another thing he's like, it's wrong to always um, like, to not enjoy life as well. Like there's, there's like a, it's like a burning, it's, it compares this to like a fire. Because a fire is the cleansing, but it also is like destructive. And so there's like all these properties of fire and with the heart. And it's, there's like these three properties of the of the sacred heart. 
And I was just listening to this message and I was like, holy shit, this is exactly what I needed to hear because I was feeling really terrible. I was feeling like inadequate in like my spiritual um, endeavors at the moment. And I was like, this is exactly what I needed. Like how crazy that this paper that I saw on the door in this small town, it was in Comic Sans and I just like read it and I was like, all right, let's go. And I'm talking to these to these like, all these old ladies <laughs> yeah, having yeah it was just it's just like saying yes to life in moments like that it's just it, you get rewarded by the cosmos by god by the universe whatever you want to call it and it's it's a it's a skill it's a muscle to start noticing those moments and leaning into them yeah and you'll notice them too because and you do have to be pretty aware like i i will say that but you'll see something like you saw the sign and then all of a sudden your brain is just gone. Like it, it is gone creating something like, and I'm, I'm sure you might've experienced that. Cause like yeah. you saw this and you were like, Oh, I wonder what, what would happen on that. And then like, you might start to have like preconceived notions of what may happen. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, cause I even still do this myself, people cut it off. They're like, Oh, like I gotta keep going. Like I, yeah. what am I like staring at this? Like back to, um, you know, whatever I've got to do um but i as i agree like the the times that i've just seen something and been like huh and then you kind of have to fight almost it seems like an anxiety of sorts because mm -hmm. anything you try something new anytime you step out for an experience like that there's the unknown like you have no clue what's going to happen what if it's super awkward what if you're there with 20 old ladies and it's weird and blah blah, blah. but like it depends on how you filter the experience um and how willing you are to go and just accept whatever your experience may be and oftentimes you're going to be rewarded like you were with um exactly what you need and it's yeah. always exactly what you need exactly well said man and i think the way certain religions certain ideas try to communicate that what you just said it like getting fed exactly what you need is they're like i heard the voice of god like i have the the holy ghost like these whisperings i i liken it to like a river like like a small spring like you notice the spring and then you start like walking down it and it, that like little channel starts getting deeper and wider and wider and eventually you are more in tune with it you can actually get stronger it's like a synapse in the brain like when you start forming that connection feel that connection it gets stronger so like for me i've heard these like little inclinations and little voices i guess where like this is a good person or this is a good idea or like you should do this you should try that I've been feeding that for so long that I can like, I think it's discernment too. Like you can tell like, this is good for me. This is evil for me. Like spiritually, this is good for me. Yeah. This is evil for me. And then you start, you start developing like a strength, a capacity to pick it out because sometimes it doesn't come to me for like days. I'm like, all right, this is just day to day life. But then suddenly I'm like, you should do that or you should not do this, you know? And that's like, uh, and it's, and it's not just like random because that feeling that intuition is backed by years of experience of what have happened when i said yes and when i said no you know and not only your years of experience like all of your ancestors all of the programming that goes yeah. into your instincts and what they are and you're right it's always a whisper because yeah. i like probably my my most recent experience with that was during the summer i was kind of having a, a tough go of it towards the end like it's just it's such a stressful job and i was talking to like a co-worker and he was doing a great job of like trying to like console me um be like kind to me but i got this weird whisper in the mm -hmm. back of my head that was like this isn't for as genuine as it seemed there was something in the back of my brain that was like this is not like there was a radar that went off and it was just yeah. like a little whisper and maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm right like i i still appreciate the guy i love the guy like we we spend the summer together but like that will always be in my head now like that little whisper yeah. and it's something i wish yeah more people should tune into it's like those little whispers um because i know like there's this imagery of you know if you want to talk about god him being this large imposing figure booming voice but i mean I don't think God yells very much. I think he he whispers yeah. a lot. Yeah, that, that's really well said. Yeah, exactly, exactly. 
Um, I know you mentioned you were reading Dostoevsky recently, right? Like notes from the underground. Yeah. How's yeah, that going? Currently, what? How's that going? It's going pretty good. I'm about like maybe um, maybe a quarter of the way through. I haven't been super um, adamant with my reading of it, but um, it's it's pretty great. Like I, I'm always finding myself, you know underlining something or circling something i think one of the biggest things that i've kind of gathered from it was like there's this great portion where he's talking about say everything was perfect for you i mm -hmm. i forget how he actually put it he's like say you had like all your cake you got to sit around all day blah blah, blah. you had the perfect life there is something within us that wants to make sure that we are not living like we're not determined to be something or to only have this one path that we will burn it all down. We will create chaos. Like mm -hmm. if there was this crystal palace, we would destroy it. If everything was perfect, we would break it. And, perfect. and we would break it just to prove that we could break it. Yeah. And I thought like that idea was great. Cause you see it, I see it in my own life. Like I'm not perfect. Like I try and strive to, spend my time doing moral things, good things, things that are going to not only be a betterment for me, myself, well, those are the same thing, but my family, like the world in general. Um, but I still screw up and I still like have bad habits and I still have these things and it can be frustrating at times. Like that's really frustrating to not, mm -hmm. to you know, strive for perfection um, and know you're never going to get it. Um, but it kind of like gave a little bit of credence that I was like, Oh, like, that's why, like, I can't have things perfect. Things will never be perfect for me. And it's not because of this government or my family or whatever. It's like, just because I have within me this like need almost to, to not be perfect, to prove that like, that's not a thing. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Yeah. That is really interesting. I think touching back and relating back to like the whole, what we talked about early about being creative beings, there is a resistance in creating something new like the resistance that's like the thing that god does he's the creator and i feel like when we self-sabotage like that is that we're trying to find that resistance in another way whereas it's much harder to feel and work against that resistance when you're creating something but you can also just like be destructive and chaotic and like return to your like basal ways you know but that's dude that's interesting yet I've heard great things about Dostoevsky. I've not read anything yet, but uh, did he? Isn't that book like Notes from the Underground? He's he was arrested actually, right? When he wrote that, like he was in prison. I am not entirely sure. the The whole concept of it, I don't know if you know that, is like the character who you never get their name. Mm -hmm. uh, he's basically living on the fringes of society, like okay. he is living like not a, as a part of any political party, any government, like he is searching almost, it seems like from like a overly individualistic standpoint, like he is only thinking about things and it's a critique on like everything. It's just like, it almost seems like he's trying to poke a hole in whatever you believe in. It doesn't matter. He's there to like poke it with the, like a prick or something. So it's, uh -huh. it, it's very interesting, but I'd, I'd love to return back to you talking about like the creative process a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it even kind of goes back to talking about, you know, not posting on social media and all these things, because I have been trying to listen to synchronicities that have been given to me um, and what I'm doing next. Cause after selling door to door, you have all this free time. Mm -hmm. And so it's really cool to like kind of sit with that a little bit and see what comes out of it. Um, and for, you know, most of the people listening probably don't know this. I'm also a personal trainer and nutrition coach. Um, so I have like a lot of health and fitness background, been working out for over a decade. Um, and I'm like starting to create my own, like it's a, it's a book basically. Like I'm nice. um, writing about my philosophy, not only for fitness, but how I use that for my life and how like there's plenty of integral moments in my life. And it's funny how, whether it was to deal with it or make it better or try and make the world a better place. Like I was like coming back to fitness in some shape or form. And then there's a very particular reason why I think people should try and be in their best shape. 
Um, and so I'm actually writing it on a typewriter in my room. Dude, let's go. And so it's this very like painstaking process where, you know, it kind of makes your fingers a little bit sore and it's not fast. It's not sexy. Like I don't get to post it in a 30 second reel on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I don't get to post it in a 12 minute vlog on YouTube. Like it's, I'm putting in just hours of time typing this because like for me personally, I was watching these synchronicities happen and I was like, I, I hate, like, I, I don't hate social media, but I just don't want to be like an influencer. I don't want that for myself. Um, but I do want to influence people. Like I want to find my medium and I've always loved reading. And so I finally just, my best friend gave me this typewriter. He's like, yeah, I don't really want this anymore. Like you want it. I was like, I guess. And then like, I just sat down and this is just what's come forth. Like, it's like, and that's where it almost comes back to Charles Bukowski, where it's like, unless it bursts out of you, like, don't do it. If you have to sit at your typewriter for hours before you can get anything on the page, like, don't do it. And like, it's just happening. And so it's just this crazy experience. And if I wouldn't listen to myself and trust myself, like I'd never be there writing it or thinking that it would have any meaning to anyone else. Hell yeah, man. That's awesome. That's, that's great. If it's not a hell yes, it's a no. Yeah, exactly. Where does that come from? I've heard that before. Yeah, is that Daniel? Know. Maybe, maybe it might be from Daniel. Shout out! Daniel. I feel like that's Daniel. Yeah, yeah, dude, that's great. Um, so, I, I, I think there's like such a strong bond between like a strong, healthy body and the mind. How, how would you rank the two? Like, what do you think should be? Say you have two twins, two the exact same amount of people. Who do you think is going to go furthest in their self development? The guy who focuses and starts with their mental mastery or the guy who starts with and focuses on their physical mastery? I think it's it's really hard to like say. It's a great question. My my knee-jerk answer is gonna be the person who focuses on their health first. Hmm. Because like I firmly believe that that is the most important thing that you can spend your time. Like make sure that you're healthy. And it kind of goes back to if you're on a um you know a plane that's going down you got to put your mask on before you help anyone else mm -hmm. um but it's also i'm not i'm not a huge science person i never have been like even back in high school like i it was too much like math and that just wasn't for me um yeah. but i do know that like studies are coming out about um how much being physically active improves your like neurological capabilities, your brain. Um, and I would just have to go with that. Like, I don't have much to back it up, but like just that intuition is just like, be healthy, have yeah. that healthy body. And then once you have that, it makes it so much easier to regulate yourself and do all these things to then like grow as your ego or who whoever you are as like a person internally yeah no that's really well said really well said yeah i would agree with you i think um even just getting physically fit or just going and involving yourself in physical activity teaches you certain things about consistency for instance and discipline that is probably one of the biggest mental wins anyways like to getting to discipline getting to consistency um yeah i think you can get a bit of both if you start with physical mastery yeah, yeah and i mean i i touch about this in my book but i think it's also like a link to your soul mm. it's, it's so much about effort and how much you're willing to push yourself and i talk about this like there's never been a time where i've had to reach down deeper and there hasn't been anything there like that and that's what it showed me and so right. whether the situation is purely physical like running a marathon or whether it's like maybe a mix of physical and mental being a, a summer of knocking doors. Mm -hmm. Like there, there was, there's just never been a time where I've had to reach down and there hasn't been more left. So then it just like brings me to thinking about like, what is our depth as a human? What, like on the inside, what, how far does that go? And I, I have to imagine that it's, like limitless and boundless mm -hmm. and that there is no end to whatever is like inside of us and whatever we can bring out and create in the world. 
Love that. Love that. Yes. Dude, I can't wait to read the book. What, what are you naming it? Uh, I. It's interesting. I'm calling it uh, the hard to kill training protocol. <laughs> uh, and it. I guess it goes back to like why I think everyone should be in their most optimal shape and their best shape and what I think that most optimal form is. Because like, it's not how you look. It's none of that. It's God forbid you're in a situation where you need to defend yourself, defend your family, all these things. Like you want to be hard to kill. You don't want to make it like, I don't know if you're going to win your fight or lose your fight, but you don't want to make it easy on anybody. Mm -hmm. And then it also like has like less physical implications. Like how, what are you going to do when life punches you in the mouth? Maybe it's not a person, maybe it's life. Maybe, you know, somebody gets cancer and they, they pass away. Um, or you have to have an unexpected surgery that knocks you off course. Like, how do you respond to these moments and how do you like become harder to kill through those as well? Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, it's kind of about core tenants of, you know, you have to be, you have to have great cardio. You have to be strong. You have to have like good flexibility. You have to be balanced. And then there's also like a whole mindset side of it as well. Like what, what makes you hard to kill up here Mm. um and so that's just kind of that's a good synopsis of what it's about love that you can apply in all the different areas man hard to kill spiritually no nihilism for us fuck that exactly (laughs) exactly man yeah Yeah. it's uh it's a fun project i'm it's like the first time that i've ever like really tried anything creatively um so and one of the things I think about too is like even if I, I fall flat on my face, like maybe it's not something worth reading. Like at least I created something. Like I got like whatever this was that was in me that I couldn't get myself to post on 30 second reels and the YouTube channels and all that. Like whatever I couldn't get out that way, like I'm finally able to get it out this way. And yeah. so I'm just excited about that. Hell yeah, man. Step into your creativeness. I love that. That's good shit, dude. Well, I'm excited to read about it. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, work with you, and maybe expand on these ideas, um, how can they contact you? Yeah, so uh, you can reach out to me on my Instagram. My name is Adam Stenny with two N's. And yeah, if you want to maybe try and figure out how philosophy and lifting weights intercede, you can you can send me a message because believe me, they do. Yeah, for sure. Oh, dude, I almost forgot. I. I, I did this in my first couple uh, podcast episodes, and then I forgot about it, and then I just picked it up again with Coomer. Um, I had a talk with Coomer. If you could meet anyone and like sit with them and, and dine with them, who would that person be? In two categories, someone fictional and then someone non-fictional, like a real person. Okay. Like well, um, if it was a real person, I would love to go and talk to myself at like seven. Like I'd love mm. to see, you know, like what that kid was like maybe before, you know, bullying or family or societal structures or whatever, like happens over the course of your life, whatever happens there. Like I'd love to just talk to unfiltered me and see what I was nice. like back then. Um, and then if it's a fictional character, have you ever seen True Detective? Yeah. I would I would have lunch or dinner with Russ Cole for Dude, sure. Let's go. Hands down. Dude, that is fascinating because philosophically speaking, he is like like you said, like a pessimist. He oh, dude, he is he is nihilistic. I love yeah. his like there's a scene of him in the car and he's talking about how consciousness was an accident. And yeah. the best thing that we all could do as humans would be to join together and stop reproducing and walk into the abyss together like that is a crazy crazy way to view life and i would love to talk to him about that (laughs) yeah man yeah absolutely and what was cool is though at the end like literally the last line of the whole show he's like i saw the darkness and i saw the light i think the lights he like it teases that he's like becoming at least some kind of spiritual optimist like seed has just sprung in him which is cool but he's really interesting man he is. And I mean, even throughout, I think like the whole season is like, you see that in his own bad way, he is that catalyst for light. Like he was always on the side of light and he always has been, yeah. 
he's just not as confident that it's winning or that it's you know he's just not as confident in it but um yeah. like there's a, i love the the line of like sometimes like you need the bad men at the door to stop the other bad men like you, exactly you need that and that's an important person in the world exactly that show is so well written man because woody's character he's the family man he's that like on paper he's doing everything right he's like shaking hands with the governor he, all his boys like him but if you get to see him he's the guy who's cheating on his wife he's the actual yep. coward like everything that uh everyone blames rust on for being like selfish and everything that's literally marty so it's just crazy like how on paper they're both flipped because rust when no one's watching him he has codes he has we have a depth to we have a depth like he has like these principles and even though he's a nihilist at the moment like he's more of a stand-up guy than marty is who's like the christian family man so it's just brilliant writing dude yeah and i think like the best way to sum it up is there's a scene where the wife is brought in for questioning from people who are like looking into the cases from way back when and she's like i always knew russ to be a good man or at least he knew who he was whereas mm -hmm. marty he never knew who he was and yeah like i know we're kind of probably getting to the end of this here so i think if i could leave it with like anything sure the show is saying it but like i'm also gonna say it is like know who you are like right. know who you are have your boundaries and be confident in that because i think like one thing maybe the stranger can teach you or lots of other philosophical works is like everyone has their own world and mm -hmm. like trust your expression of that world and like be you because and just be confident in that because i mean that's going to lead to like the most fruitful life that i think you can live love that love that that's a powerful message we'll end it there adam dude it was great talking with you again we should do more of these and uh yeah man appreciate it yes sir thank you for having me appreciate the platform okay brother take it easy i want to hear about uh notes from the underground when you finish it i will do all right bro all right man take care peace